Thank you very much for the kind introduction, for the invitation, and I'm really happy that I can be here to present the first preliminary results from the first section of my postdoc project, which deals with technological change and public opinion. And what I want to present today is a first case study that I conducted on the area of telecommunication technologies. And I want to compare some off the shelf methods for extracting sentiment information from the speeches uh, to answer my research question. And uh, future sections of the project will deal with other technologies and will also expand uh, on the methods used. The project is clearly motivated by the current discussion about AI. We have all heard about this. Many people and politicians worry about the labor market impact of this technology, that it might replace workers. And of course, as historians, we are well placed to uh, argue that this is not a new phenomenon, to point out that, of course, this has happened also with earlier technological disruptions. Every time a technology is introduced, people have hopes, but they have also worries. And what I want to look at is if these uh, discussions always play out in a similar fashion, if there are certain arguments that appear, and if fears and, and, and hopes um, can be compared over time. And to do so, of course, you have to choose a certain selection of technologies that you would, look to, would like to look at. In my case, I, I reason from the state of digital technologies and um, digital communication, which is often argued to be a, a set of general purpose technologies, because it can be used and implemented in various ways, and it impacts broad um, swaths of the population, it impacts a lot of processes, and also people in their daily lives. So if you look at earlier general purpose technologies, you could think of the telegraph um, that spread in Germany, um, especially between 1850 and 1880. And you can also think about the telephone that was more recent um, and became prominently introduced after the First World War. So you have two sets of general purpose technologies that share certain characteristics with digital infrastructure. Namely, you have uh, small marginal costs and, and high fixed costs, and you have so-called network effects, which makes it for me interesting to look at how these technologies were perceived at the time they were introduced. To do so, I will, I will um, have three sections of this talk. I will first uh, talk briefly about the data that I use, um, then present and compare different methods for extracting uh, opinion and sentiments about these technologies. And what is most important for me um, to combine this then with a quantitative and qualitative discussion of the speeches. So um, what can the methods really help us to learn about the debates in the parliament at the time? If you want to look at German parliamentary speeches from this period, um, you have a great resource at hand, namely the Reichstagsprotokolle website that I'm sure all of you are familiar with. It has, as you can see, uh, roughly 400,000 pages that have been digitized over many years and OCR, ranging from 1867 to 1942. At the beginning of this project, I recently discovered that there are also nowadays uh, a couple of corpora that can be downloaded to use these speeches um, in R. For instance, I found this German parliament corpus from researchers from the University of Frankfurt, um, which is a great resource. They use OCR based on Tesseract. However, for me, the problem was that it is made available in a very specific format, the XMI format, which differs from classic XML. And there have been already many requests in the past months to provide some information how to convert that to other formats like CSV or TXT or classic XML. But so far, these requests have not been answered. And for me, particularly, the problem is that these data have been already pre-processed a lot. And we know from research that, especially for dictionary-based sentiment analysis, the type of pre-processing has a huge impact on the final results. Another corpus I looked at is the doi -PAL, um, which has been made available from researchers that looked at anti-Semitic biases in German parliamentary speeches. It's also a great resource, but they just provide the TXT files that were constructed with OCR and um, with Abby Fine Reader but they don't provide metadata. They group those TXT files in eight folders corresponding to time slices. So for instance, Kaiserreich 1 would be 1867 to 1890 and so on. And for me, this is problematic 
because I want to look at change over time. So having yearly information would be much better. So if you don't find what you need, you construct it yourself. Um, I use web scraping to create a corpus by using the full text search of this website. Um, I, I searched for the terms that are important for me, the telegraph and the telephone, recognizing that from the first World War onwards, um, there's increasing usage of um, telegraph and telephone written with an F instead of PH. And then later I merged those searches. And what you get when you, when you use web scraping on these results is you get a, a, a certain type of co uh, keyword in context window. So you get the, the um, a search term in bold and then a couple of sentences before and after, um, roughly 250 words on average. And for sentiment analysis, this is quite neat because you don't want to use it uh, for a whole speech that talks about many issues. You only want to have that part of the speech where a certain technology might be used. So you probably don't need the rest of the speech. So this is fine. And overall, there are about 19,000 speech excerpts that I extract in that way. 16,000 referring to telegraph, 3,000 referring to the telephone. And what was reassuring to me is that if you look at the absolute numbers over time, that corresponds to actual historical developments. Of course, there's a rise because these technologies are implemented more and more. And also the peaks correspond to debates that we know from the secondary literature and that you can also confirm with close reading. For instance, the first peak uh, in 1876 refers to the telegraph tariff debate when they changed the tariff. So initially you had to pay by distance and then they established the word tariff, the so-called word tariff, which was a, a flat rate um, tariff where you paid according to the number of words that you sent, which was nice for more rural areas. Um, then in 1892, you had the first uh, Telegraph Act implemented, Reichweit, and that was a peak, of course, in the debates. Um, you have then the maximum uh, when the International Radio Telegraph Convention took place in Berlin in 1906, because at that time, radio was known as wireless telegraphy. And then uh, towards the end of the period covered, we have the Fernmeldeanlagegesetz, which amended the first Telegraph Act. Um, and the change in name reflected the fact that the telegraph declined and radio and telephone became more important. So what I first do is I implement dictionary analysis. I'm sure you are all familiar with this. We had dictionaries already yesterday. It's quite a simple method. You simply count the number of positive and negative terms according to certain pre-specified lists. And ideally you then normalize by the number of all terms, uh, which is sometimes forgotten. There's been a lot of criticism of this method. And I know there's a lot of skepticism, which is justified. I mean, it's mostly designed for modern texts. There might be unknown biases when you construct those lists. Um, we know from research that especially with economics vocabulary, there are big problems because they often express a different sentiment. And this is important for technology debates. And of course it cannot handle nuanced linguistic phenomena like metaphors, which are really important if you talk about technological disruptions because often politicians then use metaphors to convey to the listeners what this new technology means for them. Um, Another problem is negation, but as I will show later, this can actually be solved with dictionaries. However, I also want to point out some advantages that in my opinion sometimes get forgotten with all the criticism, um, especially at the start of a new project. It's an easy way to get uh, results, some orientation with your data. There are no financial costs for crowdsourcing or other things involved. And there's high transparency, which I think is an important aspect in, in age of AI methods, and um, that you have those lists where you can check really every word that has been put there, and you can see exactly how the scores are driven by certain terms and not others. And of course, it's computationally cheap and easy to reproduce, which is also good for the scientific process. The three dictionaries I used is, are probably known to you. The first one is the classic Senti uh, WS. Uh, the sentiment watchers dictionary that's used most commonly. We also have the German polarity clues dictionary that is uh, slightly longer, has more words. Um, and then finally, uh, from Rao, the German political sentiment dictionary, uh, which could be kind of a gold standard because it combines the previous two dictionaries and it adds negated forms for each word. So that overall you have 74, uh, for, 
74,000 entries. However, uh, Rao decided to not use the fine grained polarity weights that are included in these uh, earlier dictionaries. And he did a manual review to make sure that only those sentences and words and biograms are, are included that, that are indeed crucial for political language using Bundestag speeches. So intuitively, you would think this should work very well also for Reichstag speeches. To get a first sense how uh, it looks like if you apply those dictionaries to, to my data, I plot the distribution um, here for Senti uh, VS. And you can see that 76% of the sentences are classified as neutral. Um, this uh, increases um, as you go to the other dictionaries, you have the GPC where it's 78% and then Rao's um, German sentiment dictionary has the highest percentage, 81%, of course, because it has this heightened uh, negation control, which means that there is a higher probability for positive and negative to cancel each other out. When you think about these three dictionaries, the one thing that they miss, of course, is the part of speech. Um, so one of the words uh, that could be on those lists might be used out of context. It might be used in a way that actually does not deal with technology. So one way how to improve on those dictionaries could be to use part of speech information and dependency parsing um, that we can use by applying machine learning methods uh, to the corpus. Luckily, um, as in the case with the picture classification, there are already pre-trained models available. Here I use the, the Spacey Python library. Um, and you have to note that, of course, it, this, is, this has been trained on modern news corpora, not on historical speeches, so it might not be perfect. And once I, I apply this and annotate every word in my, in my data set um, with this uh, pipeline, um, I uh, implement the following four steps. First, I uh, only look at sentences containing one of the keywords. So I drop everything before the keyword sentence and afterwards. So I, I, I omit the keyword in context window and only look at the sentences where really the telegraph or the telephone is addressed. I then look only at the adjectives as classified by the parts of speech tag. And then I look at the grammatical relationship that those adjectives have. And I only look at those that specify or modify the technology. So if we go back to the previous slide, here you would see that the word expensive Toya specifies the telephone coming afterwards, there's an NK. And I only focus in my analysis now on those adjectives that specify or modify telephone or telegraph. And then I derive their GSD score, so the German sentiment dictionary score from Rau, um, context specific for that sentence. And if we then complement our picture with this fourth metric, uh, we see that, of course, you have a lot of more um, spread here of the different sentiments and, and much less observations because you only use those very specific adjectives. But I think they provide a more reliable measure for the uh, actual technology discourses. So to validate this, we can now, of course, um, use the fact that we have metadata on the year and look at how this looks if you spread it out over time. And here, the first thing to notice is that, of course, because the Senti VS dictionary has the least number of neutral sentences, uh, the curves are the highest. And then uh, the, ta the task is to validate the peaks and the trends by close reading the sources and comparing it with the secondary literature, which I did. And what you, what you find is that every time there are certain peaks, there are important annual budget discussions in the Reichstag. That's also something remarked by the scholars who investigated this by, by close reading, by selecting certain speeches. And indeed, you can find that when you, when you look here at the peaks. This is especially the case because often in those debates, they become quite emotional and there are accompanying shouts that are noted in the stenographic reports of the speeches. So people shout very right or very true. And usually we would think that this is statistical noise that should be omitted as part of the pre-processing. But I think for my opinion mining, this is quite important because it tells you something, um, which points are controversial or which points are regarded as important by many parliamenticians in, in, in parliament and not just by the single speaker. So for me, it was quite helpful that these were um, kept in the, in the OCR documents and they pointed me to quite controversial debates um, about technology. 
if we then want to see why there are certain um, positive peaks in the sentiment score, we um, see that in the for the first two peaks that you can see about 1880 and around 1900, the peaks have not so much to do with technology per se. It's in those budget discussions, the politician need a reason why they need more budget for expanding the network. So they praise their past successes. So the positive sentiment coming here has nothing to do with the technology per se, but more with political bargaining. However, for the third peak um, around 1920, this relates to an important um, aspect of the debate, because at that time they wanted to introduce a new tariff, which would have made it more exp expensive for the rural households to access telegraphs and telephones. Um, basically because there was an overload of the system and somehow they needed to reduce the traffic. So the way to do that was to increase costs. And here you could see that at this stage, the technology had already gotten such a status in society that it was discussed not only in economic terms, but also in a wider societal frame. People associated um, cheap telegraphs and cheap telephones with an, for instance, economically independent press. They associated it with freedom of expression. They associated it with liberty and progress. And these are all words that are uh, have a very high sentiment score and that I de can therefore find easily with my method. Also, the reverse is true. If you look at the negative scores, you can also find uh, certain problems that are uh, discussed in the debate. So first, uh, in the 1890s, as I told you earlier in 1897, we have the introduction of the first Telegraph Act and quite quickly it becomes clear there are a lot of problems with this act. There are legal loopholes, there are unclear questions. And as these problems become discussed, we see a dip in the negative sentiment. And that has to do with these problems being pointed out in speeches. And similar, after 1920, um, when the new tariff structure is indeed implemented it, and it becomes more expensive for rural areas and for small and medium sized companies and for the press to use telecommunication, the sentiment drops a lot because um, these problems are again pointed out in speeches and you can find many nice quotes and examples by simply searching in those speeches for the highest negative sentiments. And this is finally also confirmed by my fourth metric that I constructed myself only with these techno technology specific adjectives. And you see here a huge fall in the last couple of years. And that's especially because as this reform is implemented, um, people uh, fear that it will um, lead to societal problems and regional inequalities. And almost all of this drop um, can be related, it's over 90% to the frequent usage of the term Toya, which is of course by all dictionaries ranked highly negatively um, and that's driving the drop. And it has pointed me to a very valuable debate um, that showed that telecommun telecommunication technology at this time had already gained such a status that people discuss not only the technology or the economy, but also wider societal problems. So in short, it seems to me from this first case study that um, the way we think about uh, public opinion to technology not only depends on the technology per se, but on the way in which this technology is provided, the governance structures and the costs for accessing it. And I think that has also some resonance with today's debate. So finally, the results uh, on one slide. I use sentiment analysis to look at the relationship between telecommunication and, and political discourse. I created uh, a data set with web scraping and compared three popular German sentiment dictionaries. And this comparison shows clearly how important it is, the choice, uh, the dictionary that you use, how important it is, because there has been strong disagreement among the different dictionaries concerning baseline sentiment, as well as the size of their change over time. I then argue that you can get a more precise sentiment information by using uh, techniques such as part of speech tagging and dependency parsing to look at exact, exactly at the type of technology that you're interested in. But that, that you always have to validate through close reading and there were indeed some mixed results. So it's not overall positive. And probably that would be then my overall results. So, T sentiment analysis clearly cannot precise, very precise, cannot pre provide precise quantification, very precise numbers of historical emotions um, about technology, but you can use it as a guiding tool for finding very nice examples and very uh, good uh, sources for close reading by looking at the peaks and by looking at the relative changes in time. 
And indeed, especially the negative sentiment has been really helpful for finding technology critical sentiment that's often forgotten at a time where technology was seen as a means of overall liberty and, and, and progress.